to die for Christ, loving Christ, means to go to glory, means to go to Christ. Hello YouTube, it's Nathan from the Long Feet Blog here. Um, Jesus is still with us and um, this time we're doing something slightly different. We'll get back to the myth series, uh, mini series, uh, uh, in a little while. But this time we're going to be responding to something from BuzzFeed. Yes, BuzzFeed. Now I will lay all my cards on the table and say that I don't particularly like BuzzFeed. Some of the stuff they write is reasonably entertaining, but a lot of it is swill and uh, popularist nonsense. And that sounds awfully old and grumpy, doesn't it? I probably shouldn't be that grumpy. Never mind. There's certainly something to be written about... Um, about the influence of BuzzFeed on millennials in terms of their outlook, in terms of their humour, in terms of their politics, but that's all for another time. We're not here to criticise today, we're here to respond to a video that they produced, a sort of sequel video to the um, item that they released about three months ago called I'm a Christian but I'm not. Lutheran Satire has written, has produced and written a wonderful satirical response. It's about accepting all kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds, whether they're liberals or other liberals. Being a Christian is all about changing your beliefs to please the unbelieving world, and then calling your fellow Christians haters when they refuse to stop believing the thing you totally believed five seconds ago. Isn't it about Jesus? I'll put the link in the description below. Now today, uh, we're gonna be responding again to this so-called sequel video, and it's called Questions for Other Christians. And, it does what it says on the tin. They're, they've produced goodness knows how many questions, um, loads of them. Now, it's really interesting. I'm not really sure who their foil is here, who they're supposedly asking the questions to. It becomes increasingly clear that they're asking it not to Christians in general, not even to a specific denomination, but rather to uh, American evangelicals in general. Um, and as such, that foil most of the time just doesn't apply. In fact, there are loads of times when you could just put doesn't apply at the bottom of the video and then just be done with the question. Did your devotions actually happen if you didn't post about it on Instagram? How come we all love Tim Tebow? Woman. Why does having a diverse group of friends make me less Christian? Yeah, how come everyone's still supporting Donald Trump? Why do you think Christianity and science are incompatible? Why are you so adamant about exercising your religious freedoms but then get so offended when people of other faith exercise their religious freedoms? How come we all love Chick-fil-A? However, there are some other questions in the video that we feel the need to respond to. Why does Christian music always sound like a mixture of like Nickelback and Third Eye Blind? The fact is it doesn't all sound the same. You need to listen to better Christian music. In fact, I can help you there because there's an awesome blog run by a friend of ours called The Good Christian Music Blog. You need to go follow it. It has some awesome music with a diverse number of genres arranged in playlists. And trust me, when it says The Good Christian Music Blog, it follows on its promise. I'll link it below. Go follow, go like, go tweet, go whatever. You need to follow this. Trust me, it doesn't all sound the same. It's a myth. It used to be that, but it's not anymore. In fact, there's been a resurgence, a revolution in Christian music. Music in the last 10 to 15 years, something that we at the Long Defeat blog really want to talk about. We will eventually, and we'll eventually cover it. But for now, go follow. You need to follow that blog. It is awesome. Why can't you just pray? Why does it have to be a prayer and then like someone in the background being like, Bing, bing. yeah, this is a really tough one. Um, all three of us at the Long Defeat blog have come from free, independent, charismatic churches. And in my part, I've kind of gone through a few denominations and so has Owen. But we all know that in evangelical churches, it happens in the UK too, there is a lot of um, praise bands, there are a lot of, sometimes there are a lot of stages, a lot of performance things. And trust me, this is something that um, Christians have responded to. In fact, I'd recommend a recent article over at the UK platform called Christian Today, not Christianity Today, that's USA based. ChristianToday.com. Um, I'm not always a fan of ChristianToday.com, but in this case, they nail it. A guy called Martin Saunders wrote an article called Why a Culture of Self-Promotion Threatens to Throttle the Church. I recommend you go read it. The point is, is that evangelicals increasingly are aware of the problem of a performance 
based church and indeed it, it is intrinsically unnecessary isn't it for music to be playing ding, da, dong, 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 when a prayer is being made and in some cases it can amount to emotional manipulation and as Christians we need to be aware of that and all three of us at the Long Defeat blog have in the past um, rang that clarion bell. Now there is something to be said however for music in the context of prayer. C.S. Lewis, I think, is helpful here, and I know that's something evangelicals often say, but hear me out on this. In his screw tape letters, you've got this idea of demons talking to one another, trying their best to um, hamper the Christian spiritual life. Now, in this, the demons have a really interesting conversation. Read this, it's on your screen now. Um, one of their poets, Coleridge, has recorded that he did not pray with moving lips and bended knees, but merely composed his spirit to love and indulged a sense of supplication. In other words, there is this sense of him being a minimalist prayer. There is no need for ding 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 ding, ding or dum ba dum ba dum or eyes closed or anything like that. It was just straightforward, a sense of supplication, internal and personal and individualistic. Now, but read on. At the very least, they can be persuaded that the bodily position makes no difference to their prayers, for they constantly forget what you must always remember, that they are animals, and that whatever their bodies do affects their souls. Now, this is one of the most important points for us to bear in mind, and it is um, a genius observation on Lewis's part, and is one solely neglected, and it is simply this. It is a myth that we can somehow extricate ourselves from our bodies. Jesus' resurrection was 100% physical. God has created us with bodies for a reason to worship him with hands and emotions. He's given us food and sex and the sunlight and the wind and breath and all this stuff. He has made us physical. And so it makes sense, therefore, when we are serving him spiritually for other things to impact upon that. And it is look it's not an even it's not just an evangelical thing here all traditions have some form of music when in services we go ding da, ding 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 and sometimes there's music playing when there's prayer just like in any tradition for example be it anglican or catholic you know masses and, and songs and choirs and all that sort of stuff they do this we we as the church do this because we recognize that physical things provoke a spiritual response because we are not just spiritual we are not just physical these two have been united as evidence in the spiritual and physical resurrection of christ himself so it is important for us to allow physical things such as music to be played it is a means to an end but we have to be careful we do have to be vigilant as martin saunders has pointed out as others have pointed out that this does not amount to emotional manipulation but let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. it's an incredibly important point why are we so afraid to talk about sex? Sex is good. Have you read Song of Solomon? We're not afraid about sex. It's, that's really bizarre. Um, maybe in the past, but I'd expect that had more to do with just societal norms and expectations than the evangelical subculture. But look, have you not heard of Mark Driscoll? He preached, he was one of the most famous preachers in the last 10 years, and he preached an entire series on the Song of Solomon that was indeed sexually explicit for 18 and overs. He preached, um, he preached on sex and marriage and, and his his book on the subject goes into excruciating detail and yeah he was a controversial figure yes people criticized him but not for talking about sex just for perhaps being too explicit in how we spoke christians evangelicals in particular for the last 10 years have certainly changed their mindset it is a tired criticism now that we are somehow afraid of sex there are so many preachers now who are unafraid to talk about it um, who, I mean, look at Triple X Church, for example, triplexchurch.com. That one of the most, again, one of the most famous Christian platforms in the last 10 years, helping young guys get over porn and mass, you know, masturbation, regardless of what you think of that issue. But that, that's just there. It's there as a thing. Look, it's, it's a myth. Let's go with it. Why do you think Facebook is an appropriate place to discuss theology? Well, because it is. It's, I mean, it's, it's social media, right? You can talk about 
Uh, is there some? I'm, I'm sorry. Is there some sort of social block on what we're allowed to talk about on on social media? If so, I didn't get that memo. Listen, you can talk about comedy. Yes, you would post about a stand-up comedian saying, "Oh, this guy is really funny, and this guy's really on point with this issue." You would talk about TV, and you presumably would think that it's okay to talk about the themes and the context, and you know, and evaluate it on Facebook with your friends. Um, you talk about politics, wouldn't you? Uh, you'd talk about um, social justice issues, wouldn't you, on Facebook or on Twitter or on any social media for that example? Why is theology somehow... Why did the quote marks there? Theology does exist, it is a thing. Why is theology somehow exempt from that platform? I don't get it. In many senses, it is one of the best platforms because it is where people are at, it is free, it is easy to use, it is now, I mean it wasn't so much in the past, but it is easy to debate in the sense that it now has a reply function. It's, it's, it, that's, it's fine. Just because it annoys you doesn't mean that other people should do it. And you should certainly shouldn't tell other people they can't do it when you're happy to use Facebook to talk about politics and social media and stand-up comedian messages and, and, and everything else that you care about. So come on, this is, this is stupid. Look, there are questions to be asked about Facebook, about how we use it, about how, um, about our wisdom in using it, about the dangers of using Facebook, about how addictive it can be, uh, and how, how much of a deleterious effect on our lives and our spiritual walk that can have. There are all sorts of questions. And, and the three of us at the Long Feet blog have said, look, there needs to be a teaching series on this. It just needs to happen. But it hasn't happened yet. We'll hopefully get there. For the time being, stupid criticism. Move on. Why when Paul said that we all have our own individual gifts, that we feel the need to fit into this absolutely perfect mold? This is a really good point. I can't deny it. Look, at the end of the day, um, it is inevitable, I suppose, for a subculture to develop its own rules and forms, expectations, assumptions. But yeah, there is a problem in which we expect the people to, um, in their spiritual giftings, to behave in A, B, C fashion. And if you break that mold slightly, or if you go off the board, if at best you might be described as um, radical or, or something, but at worst you might be ostracized or just seen as a bit weird. Look, um, of course there is a need for us to say, look, the word is our plumb line, the word is our baseline, the word is our foundation, and therefore we will mould our behaviour according to what it says. That is, of course, fine and good and godly, but yeah, you're right. There has been a problem. There is a problem with, um, with, with Christians assuming that people have to be a certain way, speak in a certain fashion, dress in a certain way. It's a problem. Uh, I totally agree. I don't get it either. Um, and I suppose... In, 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 I suppose in order to be constructive here, how would we go about doing that? We have to teach on exactly that, on exactly those passages, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians 12. Teach on how the gifts are given to the body, not for ourselves, but for everyone else. Um, but yeah, it's a problem. Good point. Why are we as Christians more known by the things we hate than by our acts of love? Yeah. Um, that's a tricky one to assess because you're dealing with some nebulous a mass of popular opinion that supposedly regards the church as hateful um, and, and that it's known for being hateful and it, you know it, it knows it more for being hateful than for being loving. The problem with nebulous masses of opinion that are broad and generic and just assumed is that when you dig down into the details a lot of the time that begins to dissipate. So for example the Church of England here in the UK did a recent poll um, of non-Christians um, about what they believe about Jesus, about how they regard um, being witness to, you know, what they think of that experience, but also how they regard Christians that they know. And you can see in your screen here that the vast majority of the time they regard them as friendly, caring, good humor, generous, encouraging, hopeful. Most of the time they think they're kind of cool and, and okay and fine, just like any other person. And so they're not more known for being hateful. And in general, the church, religion has done terrible things and the church has sometimes done terrible things but you know for example Christians are among those who give the most to charity and that is a statistical statistically observed fact and and the church is seen at, here in the UK for example uh, opposing nefarious 
loan companies and charging the government with being caring to refugees and, and opposing war. And it's, it's just not that easy to say we're known. It's, it is so easy to say the church is, why is it more known for being hateful than loving? But when you dig down into the nitty gritty and when you look, even when you look at a general picture, um, it's not as simple as that. And I'm sure that's true even in the US, but I can only speak for our context here. So, um, maybe it's more complicated than even I'm assuming. So maybe it's a good thing for us to have that debate. Why do you feel like I have to constantly be preaching in order to be a good Christian? Is showing my friends love and grace not allowed to just speak for itself sometimes? Right, okay, listen, this is one of my pet peeves. And I'll lay my card on the table and find, and say, just say that it's a bit annoying. There is this perception of preaching as incredibly bad and horrible and awful. Um, and there is also this very popular, almost meme-like quote by Francis of Assisi, you know, um, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary use words. The problem, of course, is that Francis of Assisi um, possibly didn't even say that, and if he did, he was a preacher, he valued proclamation. So the reason why um, I would say that you should be preaching and all that means is just proclamation, telling the gospel, using words, um, being willing to tell the gospel even when it's uncomfortable to you, is that's exactly what the scriptures tell us to do. Yes, it tells us to be loving, but there is no sense here of this sort of force-like magical love that brings people to Jesus. Paul says, for example, um, how can they believe if they have not heard? And Jesus says, go make disciples. And what does that involve? It involves discipling them in the confession of Christ. God is sovereign over all things. As Karl Barth once said, you could, you know, God can speak through a flute concerto or he can speak through a dead dog. It is not necessary. Of course, it's not necessary for some formulaic um, proclamation to be central to your faith. However, the scriptures tell you to speak. And actually, what I want to know is, why wouldn't you speak this if you actually believe that a guy 2,000 years ago um, rose from the dead, physically destroyed death, and that he's coming back? If you actually believe anything of apostolic faith, why would you not preach it? How much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt, that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, that, that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. I don't get it. it preach isn't a dirty word. It doesn't have to be. If you found someone who you love, who you're madly in love with, you're going to tell people about them. You wouldn't just think I'm going to somehow, by my love and compassion for others, tell them about this person that I love. That doesn't make any sense. You would not only be expected to talk about your loved one, but you would um, presumably enjoy talking about him or her. Right? Same thing. How come there's a church on every block, but for some reason we can't figure out a way to work together? Yeah, uh, John 17, Jesus' high priestly prayer. I pray, Father, that they may be one as we are one. Church unity is a big issue. It is one of Paul's major concerns in Corinthians and Ephesians and elsewhere. Of course, yeah, you're right. It is It is um, sometimes really silly that churches can't work together. Sometimes, of course, some churches believe things that aren't consistent with Jesus' teachings, with um, historic church uh, Christian confessions. And as such, it is appropriate and right for us maybe not to work with them and say, bless you guys, but we're not, we don't feel comfortable working with you. That is not always a bad thing, but you're right. Church division has been a problem. Uh, what I would say is it is possible for churches to work together. What God has done, especially in the UK in the last 50 years, is miraculous. 50 or 60 years ago, if you were a Christian, it would have been inconceivable for you to um, work with another denomination, generally speaking. Now it is practically normal, and I wish I had the time to talk about this. Um, I wish I had the time to discuss um, uh, what God has done in this regard, especially in the UK. All I will say is go to... Um, I live in a in the UK, I live in a northwest town called Chester, and in Chester we have what's called Link Up, that is churches working together. It's a wonderful thing to see, link in description. It is possible, 
and churches do do this and they are doing it and God is increasingly working on this. So have, keep, keep the faith. Why, when the main message of the Bible is to love one another, that we choose to do the opposite? Okay, right. So, there are several answers to this question. First of all, the main message of the Bible is not to love one another. The main message of the Bible is that God gets the glory. God wins and we get the joy. That is the main message of the Bible. It ultimately comes down to that, that God is glorified through his son, through whom he has revealed himself, and Christ is made to look beautiful. That is the main message of the Bible. It is not about us, it is about him. As John the Baptist says in John 3, may you increase and I decrease. It's a wonderful message. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about why we choose not to love one another. Well, as, you know, again, it, it's like why a church is more known for hating than for loving. And, and again, when you get into the statistics, as I showed earlier, it's just not true. Um, of course, in some cases, we choose not to love. And there is another answer there. Why do we do that? Well, again, it's the biblical teaching on the subject. Why we do that? Romans 3. Um, all, all of us fall short of the glory of God. All of us are sinners. We have a sinful nature, and in our sinful nature, we cannot please God. And that is why sometimes we choose not to love one another, because we're not perfect, and we fall short of God's expectations. And yet God, in his grace, whilst we were still far away, sent his son, loved us, restored us, reconciled um, us to him. So that. Why do you feel like love the sinner and hate the sin is an okay thing to say? You realize that's condescending and still separating them as an other, right? Love the sinner, hate the sin saying, yeah, this needs addressing. Um, first of all, it's not a biblical construct. It's not a biblical saying. You can never find it anywhere in the Bible. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's anti-biblical, it just means that it's a-biblical. It's not pro-biblical, positively biblical, as in it's right, you can find a verse and chapter. Neither is it anti-biblical, that is necessarily opposed to what the Bible says, it's just a-biblical, it's just not there, and so we have to address it differently. It's a bit like words like Trinity or Incarnation. They're helpful, they help us guide our beliefs and our confession of faith, but um, we, we have to sort of weigh them with an open hand. Now, the saying, love the sinner, hate the sin, is, you could say that it's accurate in three ways. Uh, first of all, insofar as the Bible teaches that all human beings are sinners, the Bible also says that we are to hate our own sin, but also the Bible tells us we're to love others regardless of them being sinners. So when you put those three things together, Actually, you can see where the saying, love the sinner, hate the sin, comes from. It helps to show what it's like not to hate people just because you happen to differ with how they live their lives, right? And surely this is the same for them, right? Surely um, they would say, we've already heard it in the video, that the main message of the Bible is love. And they would, they would want to love me as a more conservatively inclined Christian. And yet they would disagree with me, presumably, on certain issues. And yet they would still love me, regardless of the fact that they would understandably, according to their own convictions and interpretation of scripture, say that I am sinning in, in what I believe. They may not use the word sin, but they would certainly say that I am not um, meeting God's standards in the spirit or something like that. So they would love the sinner, but hate the sin. And there is no difference here. As for othering, oh look, this is a tired academic cliche, it comes from Martin Buber, the I and the thou and all that sort of stuff, but look, um, <clears throat> in, if, if it's othering because it recognizes people as sinners, again, you take that up with scripture, you take that up with Jesus. But again, the video is doing the exact same thing. The entire video, and indeed the one they did a few months back, that I'm a Christian but I'm not, this entire video is based on the premise that there are Christians out there who, are, who, who think wrong, who act wrong, who speak wrong, and they are othering them publicly without actually talking to them. It's a really passive aggressive video. They're doing exactly the same things. Why do you think you can judge my relationship with God off of a handful of statements?
fruit of vipers, how can you speak good things when you're evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person brings good things out of a good treasure, or the heart, and the evil person brings evil things out of an evil treasure. I tell you, on the day of judgment, you will have to give an account for every careless word you utter. You get mad at me for not being able to back up what I have to say, but you end up taking scripture out of context so many times. <laughs> okay. You get mad at me for not being able to back up what I say. Yes, I can't back up what I say. No, okay, okay, fine. I'm being a bit unfair. Look, let's have a discussion then. Let's have an actual debate. Don't post passive aggressive things through BuzzFeed on YouTube. Let's have that actual conversation. Don't other me as some conservative Christian. Let's just have a conversation. Look, you do not need to be liberal in order to love Jesus. You do not need to be conservative in order to love Jesus. I totally know that from experience. So let's have a conversation, okay? Yes, I can't back up anything. I can say. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. Okay, enough. Let's move on. What makes you decide what makes me a good Christian? Last I checked, everyone's relationship with God is personal. Wait a second. Wasn't this the same woman who alluded to Paul's teaching on the gifts and the church and the body and that sort of thing? Paul said that we all have our own individual gifts. Paul said So it was. Your relationship with God is not personal, private individual it is of course there is that element right okay because this is the temptation for us to hear an extreme and say it's not that and it's not that actually it is a little bit of that and it's a little bit of that but the truth here is found in the tension between our relationship with god being both personal and corporate that's why paul talks about the body of christ that's why paul says do you not know that you were bought at a price therefore glorify god at your body you are not your own that's what Paul says in that same text. Your relationship is personal, yes, but it is also public. What you are necessarily has an impact on what you do, and what you do necessarily has an impact on others. Jesus wouldn't talk about the tree bearing good fruit if he didn't have in mind that others could see and taste that bad fruit and call you out on it. Well, I think that's all we've got time for, actually. Look, I don't have a major problem with BuzzFeed. I know I'm a grumpy old man, right? You could do better than this, BuzzFeed. I'm not sure why you're posting these videos. Are you posting them to open an actual dialogue with those who you might disagree with? If that's the case, then be clear about who you're talking to, because most of the time when you talk to other Christians, you're talking to American evangelicals of a Tea Party description, and that might be fine, but not all of us are like that. So don't post on YouTube to generic bunches of Christians and call it a conversation, because it's not. If you're posting this, however, just to throw other Christians under the bus, I really, really find that distasteful. If you're a Christian and you believe in the words of Jesus, then how about you believe this? I give you one commandment. Love one another. The Long Defeat blog is open to your questions and to that dialogue. Just let us know. But for the rest of you, I hope you've had a good time. Hope you've had a good week. God bless you guys. We hope to talk to you soon. Keep the faith. Thanks very much. God bless. Bye.